Okay. Uh, so uh, thank you. Oh, wait, one. Are we recording this? Yeah, yeah. I just start. I just started the recording. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, today I want to talk about some uh, generating functions associated to uh, character polynomials. So. So the motivation for this is we were looking at two kinds of problems. As uh, as Zabroki mentioned in his talk, there are three currently open, interesting problems. One is the description problem. So, uh, if you have an irreducible uh, polynomial of uh, GLN and you restrict it to S, then uh, what is a combinatorial interpretation for the multiplicities of each SN irreducible that occurs in this uh, restriction? So that's called a restriction problem. One interesting question. Another one is the Kronecker problem. Uh, it says if you uh, tensor together two uh, irreducible representations of SN, that itself is, an ir is a representation of SN. And uh, what is a combinatorial interpretation for the multiplicity of each irreducible SN representation that occurs in this tensor product? So that's a Kronecker problem. The third is uh, explaining, uh, sorry, expanding plethysm. So if you have uh, the plethysm of one symmetric function into another symmetric function, you want to expand them in a particular basis of symmetric functions. Usually, uh, the questions relate to how to expand them into the Schur basis, but also the monomial basis or uh, anything really. So, what are the coefficients? What do they count? That's a third type of problem. So, mainly, uh, we want to get insights on the first two types of problems so, the restriction problem and the chronicle problem, uh, which is why we want to use. Uh, character polynomials and to find generating function for these. Now why generating functions are important in this setting is because uh, we're going to be looking at sequences of spaces Vn where each Vn is a representation of Sn. So we're interested in uh, general behavior as n is uh, as n varies. And since generating functions give us uh, an expression for uh, like a vast, uh, it gives us expressions for uh, the underlying quantity as the argument increases. So as n increases, it's going to give us information for every n uh, what the behavior is. That's why uh, generating functions are good for this setting. Also, uh, these coefficients that I just mentioned, the restriction coefficients and the Kronecker coefficient, uh, these values stabilize for large enough n. Uh, we'll discuss what large enough means uh, in a while. Uh, this behavior was observed for uh, the restriction coefficients by Littlewood and for the Kronecker coefficient by uh, Moyna. Uh, so we are interested in these stability behaviors and uh, it's easy to get this kind of stable information from the generating function uh, just by manipulating uh, or setting some values equal to one, etc. Also, the hope is that if we obtain generating functions, there's a calculus for the underlying uh, combinatorial objects. So operations like adding to generating functions or multiplying to generating functions, they have uh, an analog on the level of combinatorial objects. So when you want to build uh, like these complicated uh, type of objects, uh, you know, it might help if we know the generating functions and we can break it up into parts and say like this part counts this thing, therefore uh, you uh, frame this object as like a product or a sum of certain basic objects. So that's the hope, and that's why generating functions. So let's start with uh, character polynomials. Uh, first, let, we all know what a class function is. A class function is uh, a, a function on a group that is constant on a conjugacy class. Now here we'll talk specifically about class functions of uh, symmetric groups. Uh, so here are the most basic examples. Uh, these functions xi. xi of a permutation is the number of i cycles there's a number of cycles of length i. So in this example, x1 is the number of one cycles in this permutation uh, sigma. So there's only one one cycle. Similarly, x2 is two because there are two two cycles and x3 is one because there is one three cycle. These are the building blocks for uh, the character polynomial. So now we consider a sequence of uh, spaces Vn where each Vn is a representation of the symmetric group Sn. This sequence is said to have eventually polynomial character 
if there is a polynomial in these uh, functions xi, where recall that xi is the number of i cycles. So if you have a polynomial in these, uh, uh, this should be x. Uh, so if, if you have a polynomial in these variables, such that uh, for all integers greater than some minimum uh, integer, if you substitute this uh, permutation of uh, Sn into the polynomial, then you get the character of the representation. So you have a polynomial where for <coughs> for all uh, for an infinite number of values of n, that means for n is greater than some minimal n, uh, you have a polynomial that uh, gives the character of this uh, permutation, right? So let's look at an example. Uh, let's consider uh, sim2 cn, that is, uh, this is just given by uh, terms ei, ej, where i and j are both between 1 and n. So it's a sec uh, second symmetric tensor power. So this quantity trace of Vn, which is basically the character, the character is the number of uh, fixed points, right? So it's the number of uh, two element multisets of n that uh, this permutation fixes. So let's say uh, the permutation has x1, one cycle. So you can pick any of those one cycles and repeat the element twice. That will be a two element multiset and it will be fixed. So that corresponds to this first term here, which is x1. Uh, can you also see when I'm highlighting something with the thing? Okay, no. Yeah, uh, we can see that. Oh, okay. uh, so that corresponds to this first thing. This is like pick one element uh, of a pick one one cycle. That is a fixed point of the permutation and repeat it twice. Or what you can do is you can pick a two cycle and then you just... Uh, uh, repeat the two cycle once, so you have two elements. So that's a two element multiset. In fact, a two element set of n. So that's x two, and x one choose two is you pick two fixed points which are distinct from uh, among the fixed points of uh, the permutation, right? So x one is the fixed number of fixed points of the permutation. You pick two distinct ones. So that is again a two element set of n, right? So the you add them all up, and that is the polynomial, the character polynomial of sim two c n is uh, this term here, right? Uh, uh, the polynomial that fulfills this requirement here is called a character polynomial for this uh, sequence of representation, right? Uh, here are a few examples which we will probably need in some time. And so we, and also I basically I want to highlight what techniques we use to calculate uh, the moment. So I just want to introduce these now. So. Uh, Let's look at a generalization of sim2, which is sim kcn. And so we have this character polynomial, which is uh, uh, the product of xi multi choose bi. This is the number of ways of picking, this is the number of ways of assembling a multi set of size bi when you have xi elements. So you can choose an element multiple times in this. So that's what the MCH chooses. Uh, there is a conversion between this and just the ordinary, uh, what do you call it? Uh, n choose k function. So xi multi choice bi is xi plus bi minus one choose bi. Right. So it's the number of ways of building a multi set of size bi from uh, xi element. And uh, you carry out this summation over all partitions of k. So that is a character polynomial for hk. Uh, throughout this paper, we follow the convention that uh, a Greek symbol denotes a partition and then uh, one raised to the corresponding English symbol denotes the multiplicity of uh, one cycles, two, two cycles, etc., or parts of size one, parts of size two, depending on whether it's a partition or the permutation, right? Uh, also, we denote uh, this xi choose bi, the product, by x choose beta. So it should be understood that this is just a product. Okay. Okay. <laughs> So uh, at this point, why are we using character polynomials specifically? This problem is, uh, these two problems, the restriction problem and the chronicle problem have been studied for at least like 70 or 80 years. And most of the literature deals with it from uh, the symmetric function, symmetric polynomial side. Uh, for example, if you, uh, you have this theorem by Littlewood that says that the restriction coefficient uh, is the multiplicity of S mu in uh, S lambda. So the, let me remind you this R mu R mu lambda is the yeah, it's the 
multiplicity of the spec module corresponding to lambda when you restrict the while module corresponding to mu to the symmetric group. Right? So they're saying that this restriction coefficient is the multiplicity of S mu in S lambda. But uh, by this paper, by six, this is uh, basically the induction uh, functor paper that um, we wrote with Amri. So by this, we know that uh, this S lambda of one plus H plus H1 plus H2, where by the way, H1, H2, et cetera, are just a complete homogeneous symmetric function. So we know that this plethysm is the character of the induced representation of the irreducible uh, corresponding to lambda to GLN. So you take the spec module corresponding to lambda and you induce it to GLN in some way, which is described in this paper. Uh, and then the character of that module is S lambda one plus H one plus H two, etc. Uh, similar approaches exist for uh, the Kronecker problem where uh, Orenan has a Broki, etc. define a new basis for symmetric function, which play the role of uh, kind of enumerating SN character. So uh, their uh, structure constants are given by uh, reduced Kronecker coefficient. That is the stable value of Kronecker coefficients. And uh, their, uh, the change of basis from the sure functions is given by the restriction coefficient. So most of the approaches figure on this side, which is basically looking at it from the GLN side. It's like you induce an uh, irreducible from SN to GLN. And then you uh, use its, uh, its character on the GLN side, which is a symmetric function. And then you work on it from that side. So character polynomials that can be thought of as looking at it from the SN side, because we are basically we're obtaining class functions for all of these SN representations. And it, you know, it should be possible to work out what the irreducibles are from there. Uh, these occur in the work of uh, Garcia, Gupil, also a paper by uh, Ashraf, which is particularly about two row character polynomials, which is what one refers to. Uh, so they do occur in the work of Garcia, Gupil, but overall uh, they are like less developed in the literature. So uh, particularly what this paper aims to do is uh, kind of simplify a result of Garcia, which is a recursive expression for the character polynomial associated to a certain family of a certain family of spec poly, uh, spec module. So what you do is you have a partition lambda one and then you attach a long row to the front of lambda. One. And then uh, this the size of this row is n minus uh, the size of lambda. So this is now a partition of size n. <clears throat> now, if you take this sequence as n varies, that uh, is that sequence has a character polynomial associated to it, which first occurs in the work of McDonald. But Garcia and Gupil in their paper give us a recursive definition of this uh, character polynomial, which we aim to like clean up and use. Yeah. So at this point, uh, let's introduce what we mean by moment. <coughs> <coughs> Now recall that uh, so if you have two character polynomials, they are essentially, uh, if you have two character polynomials and you're evaluating them on some symmetric group SN, then P and Q are class functions of SN. And so we can uh, apply the inner product on class function, which is this expression, right? Uh, this expression, is, I mean, it's just simplification from the original expression. Uh, so when you apply these class functions, Right. So when you apply these class functions, and if you assume that either P or Q is an irreducible <coughs> is an irreducible of SN, then you should get the multiplicity of uh, the irreducible in the module corresponding to P. Right. So this is basically the method. What we want to do is we want to find a simplification for the uh, character polynomial of the spec symmetric function. And then we want to just find its moment with uh, various modules like uh, while module, uh, H lambda, you know, sim lambda, while modules, uh, tensor product of other spec modules. So we just want to evaluate this moment. <clears throat> Let's see how to evaluate the moment of uh, just the thing in general. So here we are going to prove that uh, this moment, when I write a moment without an, uh, without this, uh, without a following n, then I just mean the stable moment. 
so what i want to say is uh, the moment of x choose beta evaluated at some n stabilizes and that stable value is equal to 1 by z beta where z beta is the size of the centralizer corresponding to beta so this z beta is Right, so this z beta is uh, the product over i, i raised to bi times bi factorial, where again recall that bi is the number of i's in uh, the partition beta. Right, uh, so okay, let's prove this. Let's start with the definition of what a moment is. Is just uh, this expression inside the angular brackets evaluated at every partition. Uh, we can break this up again by definition into the product over i. <laughs> Now the crucial step is uh, recognizing that right. Uh, the crucial step is recognizing that uh, the expansion of exponent t raised to uh, i gives us most of the terms in this moment calculation. Right? It gives us one by i raised to ai ai factorial, which is one term that we need. So we just need to make some kind of substitution into t so that it gives us the remainder of this. So, uh, right. So in this case, what is the substitution? Uh, first, we just let uh, the exponent run. If we differentiate this exponent bi times with respect to the variable t, then you'll get uh, ai falling factorial bi, right? You'll get ai ai minus one, ai minus two, etc. Up to bi, and then you divide that whole thing by bi factorial, and then you get ai choose bi. So if we do this following operation, where uh, now I've substituted in place of t, t, t raised to i, because I need this to work out. Uh, I need the exponent of t to work out to n. So I need it to be summation of i raised to ai, right? So this will be t raised to i raised to ai. And then when I do the product over all i, it will be t raised to summation i ai. So, and then I just isolate the n term and I'll have the evaluation of this at n, right? Except not the end term because every time I differentiate it, I'm removing one. So the total will be t raised to i raised to ai. The t raised to i into ai minus t ra minus t raised to i into ai minus bi. That's going to be the total after I'm done differentiating it. Right. So the coefficient I'm looking for in all of this will be this, just this. And so now I just actually carry out this uh, differentiation every time I differentiate i'm differentiating with t raised to i remember it's not with respect to t so uh, every time i do this differentiation i just get an i term outside so i'll get in total i raised to bi and then the term inside the exponent the exponent won't remain the exponent will just be unchanged so i'll get this and now the second kind of trick that we use is that uh, the exponent of t raised to i upon i is uh, summation of t raised to i upon i is log of 1 by 1 minus t and exponent of log of this thing is just 1 upon 1 minus t. So we just use this thing to give us that uh, this entire expression that we had up there which is the differential is equal to 1 over 1 minus t into uh, this quantity is 1 by z beta right as we define beta here. So yeah this is just the uh, what we're looking for is a coefficient of t raised to n minus the size of beta in this expression. But uh, the one by one minus t is always going to be, it's going to be one plus t plus t squared. So whatever uh, exponent we look at, the it's going to be one upon z beta, right? And it's going to stabilize for all n is greater than the size of beta because it's going to be the same term, right? So that is, uh, I, that example was to kind of highlight the differentiation part of it. And then uh, here is the other part of what we need later in the proof. We are going to evaluate the moment of HK. Uh, remember that uh, HK is the character polynomial of SIMKCN. So we're going to evaluate its uh, moment. And it is going to be the uh, this coefficient on the right. 1 over 1 minus uh, Tz raised to J which you which is basically the number of 
partitions of k into at most t parts, right? Is one over uh, one minus t z raised to j. It's just uh, each t is counting a part, so it'll be uh, number of partitions of k, and then it should be into at most n parts. So, yeah. So again, we start from definition. We just this, this is all just from definition. Uh, and then uh, the crucial step here is recognizing that, so basically how do you get this term? Because the rest of it comes with the exponents. How do you get this term? You get it like this. You get it by uh, substituting this equation. So it's just t raised to a, yeah, whatever, whatever. So t has to count uh, the n at which it's evaluated. And then z has to count the k at which it's evaluated. Right? So, so, so Shridhar, is it, uh, so can you just go back to your uh, previous slide? So is it uh, this product is outside the um, t to the n z to the k? Um, sorry, what does this mean? The coefficient of t to the n z to the k in uh, one over one minus t z to the j, and then you're taking the product over j. Is it? I mean, it's a product of those coefficients. No, yeah, it is a product. Uh, you can write the sum outside. I don't know if that will make it different. But yeah, basically, I want to write. Uh, one Shouldn't you first compute the product? Uh, yeah, it's, it's more like uh, so you compute the product and then take the coefficient, maybe. Is that yeah. right? Yeah, we compute the product on each of the BI and then take the coefficient. So that square brackets t to the n z to the k should be outside the product, to the left of the product. Oh, okay, okay, on the first part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's okay. the bn z to the k of the total. Okay, okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, right, so uh, hkn, so we have an expression that gives us the what we want basically this uh, multi choice bracket so the only thing we need to change in this expression is the t has to go to t raised to i and the z has to go to z raised to i so then we get this expression exponent of t raised to i one one over uh, one minus z raised to i one over one minus z raised to i again we can expand it uh, one plus z raised to i plus z raised to i etc so so there's some general uh, principle here, right? So, uh, so can you go back? So you're using that uh, expression. No, before that you had x t. So you said there's only one thing that you have to realize: x t raised to i by i is. Uh, oh yeah. Uh, yeah. So. X of t raised to i by i. X of yeah. t t by i. Yeah, yeah. So, so is this this is the only thing you're using again. Um, yeah, we just need to find an expression to substitute into t, which gives us uh, like basically the rest of the moment. In this case, it's a h will be a. Okay, then, let's go back and do it slowly. Uh, yeah. The first one or the second one? The second one. Okay, so uh, here, this is just the, I've written out the expression for the moment. And then now I'm saying like what will give us uh, this term a i choose b i for all partitions uh, of k. So when some, when it says all partitions of k, the the whole thing with the generating function is you do it in general and then you assign a variable that counts k, right? So what I'm saying is I just want a i raised to a a i. I just want a i to multi choice b i uh, some variable which z z raised to i b i. So that's what I want. Right. So this is what this expression gives. If you if I take t upon one minus z and I raise it to ai, then it's t raised to ai, and one over one minus z raised to ai is this uh, whatever multi multi choice multi choice thing, bracket. And I want the expression I want is t i raised to ai and z i raised to bi. So in place of t and z here, I'll take t raised to i and z raised to i. Which is how I arrive at this, right? Yeah, yeah, good. So uh, now, and then from here, I just expand this one over one minus z raised to i into different powers of z raised to i. Uh, this should be z raised to two i, not z square i. Uh, yeah, and then uh, here I had product over i, and then sum over uh, z raised to uh, j i, right? One over one plus z raised to i plus z raised to i, whatever. So now I'm going to exchange this product and this summation. So the product is going to be over different j's. And then the thing, that, uh, the sum is going to be a different i. I'm just a little confused. Can you go back? Uh, uh, 
1 over 1 minus z i is 1 plus z i plus z 2 i. So how come you have it in the numerator over there? Oh, it's divided by. Okay, okay, good. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Wait. So yeah, so we end up with this calculation, and for each of these, uh, for each of these j, this calculation is basically one over one minus z j t. Right. So h k of n is this expression. It's uh, the it's h k of n is the coefficient of t raised to n z raised to k in this expression, which is in fact the number of partitions of size of size uh, k. With at most n parts, uh, the stable value of this is uh, if you take n is greater than k, obviously there are no uh, partitions of k with more than k parts, so it will stabilize at some point. That point is k. So n is greater than or equal to k, it achieves a stable value. Uh, you can also, in general, if you have a generating function uh, with a variable assigned to the n and you want a stable value. What you do is you remove the one over one minus t term from the expression, and then you set t equals one, right? So in this expression, there will be a, a z ra z raised to zero t, which will be one over one minus t. So you, you remove. This, uh, do you mean multiplied by one minus t and then set t equals one? Right. Yeah. You, you multiply it by one minus t and then set t equals zero. So if you multiply this expression by one minus t, recall that uh, z uh, z raised to j t raised to something else uh, like the z t counts the number of partitions of the exponent of z into at most t part so when i multiply this whole expression by 1 over 1 minus t the z raised to uh, k1 t raised to n1 will now count the number of partitions of k1 into exactly n1 parts right because i'm multiplying 1 minus t through the equation and then when I set j uh, t equals one, it will just sum over all the parts. So it will sum the partitions of k into exactly one part plus the partitions of k into exactly two parts plus etc. So on up to k. That is the idea behind multiplying it by one over one minus t and then setting t equals one. Right. So uh, now that we kind of know the two basic method let's move on to uh, this character polynomial of spec module uh, mcdonald gave this initial formula for the character polynomial spec module it says that uh, if you have so recall that this will be if i if i have some uh, integer n and i have uh, a permutation of n and i substitute it into this character polynomial it won't give you the character of uh, lambda it will give you the character of lambda plus uh, a join a first row of size n minus lambda, right? That's the uh, idea of character polynomial. Just uh, yeah. Anyway, so uh, the character polynomial associated to this family is you first remove a vertical strip from lambda, and the length of that vertical strip gives you the sign on the rest of the term, and then uh, you basically do this. Uh, the character of new, which is lambda minus the vertical strip, the character of new evaluated at some uh, partition row into x choose row. So this is formula, uh, even though it's convenient to work out like example, small example and stuff like this, but in general, it's hard to find a generating function for this because it involves this uh, character term. And I don't know how to, uh, like, I don't know how to make a generating function out of that because it's a evaluation of some character value. Also, in general, you can't make a rule for uh, how to remove a vertical strip, I think. I don't know. It's difficult to work with this. Is my point. So, uh, so, so see this, sir, just a second. Uh, what is this, sir? Remind me what Q lambda was again? Uh, Q lambda is a character polynomial associated to uh, the family lambda square bracket n. By lambda square bracket n, what I mean is. Uh, okay. Uh, so lambda square bracket n is only meaningful when n is greater than the size of lambda plus uh, the first row of lambda. So okay, that means that uh, that condition is to ensure that when I add a row of size n minus lambda into the first row, it is in fact the first row. That means it's the largest. Row. So it's a spec module basically. Yeah, yeah it's a spec. Of that uh, with first row being that long row. Okay, fine. And this, uh, sorry, another thing, this your uh, z beta equals whatever you just wrote. 
seems to carry over on all slides yeah i don't know how to get rid of okay anyway never mind okay so can you say about this vertical strip i mean mu, mu is lambda minus vertical strip right of of what length i mean can you give an example of any length so uh, let's take a let's say lambda is just one row okay so it's a single row so uh, it's first how do you so let's look at all of the ways of removing a vertical strip from a single row in the first case you don't do anything it's a vertical strip of length 0 so the sign is uh, negative 1 raised to 0 which is 1 and then row is now a partition of new which is lambda minus a vertical strip but we haven't removed anything from lambda so post can believe oh, okay uh, so we have so we haven't removed anything from lambda so new is uh, lambda right new is lambda so we have the character of lambda evaluated at row which is some uh, partition of size lambda x choose row right and then uh, we can also remove a vertical strip from a single row by removing a single cell right the last cell if you remove it that's a vertical strip in that case we've removed uh, the length is 1 because we've removed the number of rows occupied by the vertical strip is 1 so a negative 1 raised to 1 which is minus and then a uh, row is now a partition which is one less than it's a single row and its size is one less than lambda right so these are the two ways to remove a vertical strip when lambda is uh, when lambda is a single row when it's two rows you can either remove uh, when say it's two rows and the, both the rows have the same uh, say it's two rows rectangular shape so lambda 1 equals lambda 2 then you could remove a vertical strip by removing a cell from the second row or you can remove a vertical strip by removing uh, the last cell from both rows or you can remove a vertical strip by not removing anything at all okay uh, okay you so, can also remove a cell from the first row if it's strictly longer than the second row right yeah uh So yeah, the, so that expression is not great to work with. But uh, Garcia and Gupil in that paper gave this uh, recursive formula for the character polynomial. So let me just explain it. Uh, this thing is self-explanatory. R lambda is uh, lambda minus the first row, right? So uh, it's pretty confusing because like you're adding a row onto lambda to give the lambda n, but that's not what we mean by removing the first row. Uh, R lambda means remove the first row of lambda. right so it's not remove the first row of lambda n uh, so it's r lambda of evaluated at uh, alpha where alpha is some partition of n uh, into this product so now uh, this down arrow with the product what how you so how we deal with the down arrow is first you expand this term into monomials uh, monomials in xi and then the monomial xi raised to j becomes uh, this you make this transformation right so basically this uh, x raised to uh, x raised to j becomes x falling factorial j which is in fact uh, x falling factorial j is just j factorial upon x choose j so this is the umbral calculus right oh yeah it's it's called the umbral calculus so uh, before i state what our simplification is we need some notation this is pretty from okay can't remember this anyway uh, so given a partition uh, we define uh, the cumulate whatever uh, the sum partition mu is the so the first entry so the cum of mu is a tuple of of length l if mu is of length l then it's a tuple of length l the first entry in the tuple is the size of mu the second entry in the tuple is the size of mu minus the first row the third entry in the tuple is the size of mu minus the first two rows etc up to mu l so the ith entry in the tuple is the size of mu minus the first i minus 1 row okay so that's what we mean by uh, cum of mu and then we need this summation with, uh, so suppose you have a function that has uh, l arguments and the uh, l arguments happen to be partitions theta 1 to theta l right and then you have this polynomial which breaks up into uh, some 
sum of monomials. So we define the sum over the partition mu and over the polynomial t of the function f as basically you replace each monomial t raised to alpha by this sum, right? So each t raised to alpha specifies the sizes of the partitions theta 1 to theta l. And the, the sizes are basically you subtract uh, the subtract from this cumulant part from this cumulant you subtract the corresponding uh, entry of alpha right uh, it's probably a difficult thing to uh, get so let's do some examples so let's say uh, we have single row partition uh, two and then the our polynomial is one minus v1 and then we want to sum the function theta one so it has just one argument the number of arguments has to be equal to the number of uh, what is it? The length of the partition. I mean, you can add zeros to increase the length of the partition. So there's not a real constraint. But anyway, so you sum this function f over mu and p by replacing in each monomial, you replace the sum. So uh, corresponding to one, that is v1 raised to zero. So the size of the partition theta one will be the cumulant of mu, which is two, minus the exponent of v1, which is zero. So it'll be two. And corresponding to this monomial v1 which occurs with uh, its appropriate size it will be the cumulant of mu which is 2 minus the exponent of 1 uh, of v1 which is 1 so the size of theta 1 will be 1 right uh, it's probably very simple so let's look at another example where uh, it's a two row shape and then uh, it's uh, whatever mu is 2 comma 1 p is 1 minus v1 into 1 minus v1 v2 and f is uh, theta 1 choose theta 2. So now the cumulant of mu will be 2 plus 1, 3, and 1 plus nothing, so 1. So it will be 3, 1. The cumulant is 3, comma 1. Right? So for each monomial, we just have to, sub we just have to subtract the corresponding uh, exponents of v1 and uh, v2 from this cumulant. So corresponding to the monomial 1, it will just be theta 1, theta 2. The exponents of v1 and v2 are both 0. So cumulant minus 0, 0, which is 3, 1 minus 0, 0. So it's 3 and 1. So the size of theta 1 is 3, size of theta 2 is 1. So this is corresponding to v1. So corresponding to v1, uh, 3, 1 minus 1, comma 0. Because the exponent of v1 is 1 and the exponent of v2 is 0. So 3, 1 minus 1, 0 is uh, 2, 1. So these are the sizes of theta 1 and theta 2. And then this is uh, corresponding. Yeah, this is uh, corresponding to the v1, v2 term. So the v1, v2 term is uh, comes with a minus sign first of all, and it'll be theta one, theta two, three one minus one one, which is two zero, right? And then uh, corresponding to the v1 square, v2 term. So three one minus two one, which will be 1 comma 0 so this will be 1 comma 0 uh, is that clear is sorry uh, yeah can you explain this theta 1 choose theta 2 what this means so these are two partitions right just, uh, just uh, some function f oh sorry uh, what uh, so uh, i'm trying to this is basically no, short no, no, but what is okay what is the meaning of theta 1 choose theta 2 it's a function in two argument Oh, it's just f of theta 1 comma theta 2, is it? No, no, f, if this is a function. f equals theta 1. Uh, it's like uh, f of x comma y equals x choose y. Okay, but theta 1 and theta 2 are partitions. So what is one partition choose another? It's uh, uh, the product of the a, b i choose a i kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Um, and the signs uh, just follow the signs in your monomial. The coefficients just follow the coefficients in your polynomial expansion right so so these signs are just the coefficients the plus ones and minus ones when you expand them so, yeah right. so this is just a shorthand notation that uh, can we just look at the definition once again um oh, the definition ah yeah 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 that's right okay so it's sum over c alpha and then the stuff inside is what you calculated i yeah. see okay so each monomial uh, basically prescribes the sizes of the partition in this function. So this is, um, does this in any way generalize umbral calculus or something? Because again, it's like you're taking something and then you're substituting some binomial. Uh, 
at least up to some scalar uh it might if like if we find uh, what the symmetric function analog to doing this is like if you work on a symmetric function level so there is like that uh, line from symmetric function to like how you get from a symmetric function to the character polynomial so on that level it might correspond to umbrellaizing uh, no no maybe even on this level it's like you're replacing of each monomial by some binomial coefficient whereas in umbrel calculus you replace each monomial uh, in a single variable by a uh, falling factorial oh uh, that, that is the same thing Yeah. Yeah. So, so this, so this, yeah. So, huh? So this looks very similar somehow, right? I mean, except that j factorial thing is not there, but you again are replacing a monomial by uh, by a multi-nomial product of binomial coefficients. Yeah. So it it looks like some. It almost looks like a multi-variable umbral calculus. This is basically umbral calculus. I mean, I just wrote j factorial x to j instead of x falling factorial. No, no, I agree that this is umbral calculus. Also, that sum that you are trying to define is some sort of umbral. It seems like it's some sort of multi-variable umbral calculus. Ah, uh, it could be. I I don't know. I haven't looked at it from there. Basically, I just define the sum because it's the sum over several. I'm looking for several coefficients in a generating function, and those. Uh, coefficients are given by uh, these restrictions so instead of just looking for different coefficient i'm going to say it's the same as multiplying the whole generating function by some polynomial in fact the polynomial p and then finding a single coefficient so that's why i, I did introduced... that yeah yeah but i'm just wondering maybe it can be fit into some sort of umbral calculus uh, multi yeah, it does look kind of like that's the... So uh, anyway, what I was talking about is the following. Uh, so suppose you have this function, uh, like the previous thing that we have. F. You can think of a function as theta one to theta two if it helps. But suppose we have some function in uh, theta one to theta l, and then we have a generating function for this function. So we have f theta one up to theta l, and then v one up to v l record the sizes of theta one up to theta l. So we have the generating function. Uh, suppose we uh want to sum this uh, f over mu and over the polynomial p it, it's the same as looking for the coefficient of v raised to uh, the cumulant of uh, q mu in the generating function times the polynomial right so basically when i'm summing the function over this mu and p what i'm essentially doing is looking for a single term uh, sorry what is p p is uh, the polynomial over which i'm summing oh yeah yeah okay this is one more thing yeah right so the summing uh, so you can think of these f if for this generating function these f theta on the theta l are basically the coefficients of v1 up through vl right v1 raised to theta 1 up to vl raised to theta l. so uh, by summing by this uh, summing on the left hand side uh, over mu and p i am summing different coefficients in a generating function so this is the same as looking at a single coefficient in the generating function times the uh, polynomial right okay there is no question one second just one one thing uh yeah so capital f is the generating function of little f and so you just multiplying that cap, cap generating function of capital f is already the generating function of little f right and so i'm uh, summing different coefficients in the generating function right right right, right. okay okay because the degree of the monomial plus the degree coming from f has to be equal to q of mu right based on how it is defined Okay, so this is where the cum thing comes up in some sense. Yeah, it's just designed to make that happen. Right. right. Yeah. So uh, yeah, defined basically so that uh, the size of theta one plus whatever comes from alpha is equal to cum mu. So uh, that's why you can instead of mul uh, summing over several coefficients, you can just multiply the generating function by some polynomial and then look for a single coefficient. So this is basically what we use. and then we are looking for some uh, like specific 
polynomial. So like these polynomials are the following uh, for these dij are defined as one minus vi, one minus vi, v1, vi, vi plus one up through one minus vi dot 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 vj. So right. So suppose i is one and then j is two, then this would be one minus v1, one minus v1, v2. So if i is uh, one and j is three, it would be one minus v1, one minus v1, v2, one minus v1, v2, v3. Right. So that is d, and then uh, tij is just the product over several t. I mean, these definitions kind of they seem like without motivation, but uh, they use full like they use later on. So that's why I'm defining them now. So now that we defined all these terms, uh, what we aim to prove is that the spec generating function is the sum over mu and over this polynomial T1L of uh, the following thing. Right. right. So uh, how we're going to do this is we start with uh, first we start with the uh, recursive version of the spec gen uh, whatever spec character polynomial that was obtained by Garcia and then we expand it to uh, some term that is of this kind where like you have a function in uh, the partition beta one and then you have some constant uh, it's a constant for x but it depends on beta one so you have this constant that depends on beta one and then we uh, like uh, we compute this constant basically and then we simplify it so those are the three basic steps so let us start with the first step the first step uh, this is just the definition right so, uh, and then uh, from the definition i just use binomial theorem to obtain the second step right and uh, as i said the down arrow acts on each monomial xi raised to bi by changing it to bi factorial xi choose bi so that is a simplification that has been made in the third step and then the fourth step just takes this uh, product over all i and then it changes each ei and bi to the corresponding thing for alpha and so a summation of ai is uh, the length of alpha summation of bi is the length of beta i i raised to bi bi factorial the product over that is uh, uh, z beta right uh, product of ai choose bi is alpha choose beta and then this is x choose beta. so from here to here is just uh, removing this product over and then finally what we do is uh, you note here that this bi is constrained to be less than or equal to ai because it's ai choose bi it's by binomial theorem but if bi were greater than ai then this term would just be zero so we can actually drop the constraint on bi because we are not at risk of over counting thing right we're not like when bi is out of this range it's going to be zero anyway so we can drop the constraint on bi and then we can interchange the order of summation right because if we drop the constraint on bi it's not restricted it it doesn't depend on alpha in any way so we can change the order of summation uh, if we are convinced by that uh, go ahead so uh, yeah once it, the order of summation i just take all of the things that don't depend on alpha outside here so these are all the things that don't depend on alpha and then all of the things that depend on alpha are in this uh, after the sum so right so the sum is over all beta of all sizes i think uh, yeah, a priori it's over all sizes, but if it uh, goes outside the admissible limit, this alpha choose beta term will just be zero. Sure, sure. Right, so uh, so we get this part outside the box that doesn't depend on alpha, and the part, part in the box does depend on alpha. And the part in the box uh, is the moment of something, right? It's like uh, 1 over z alpha of uh, something which is evaluated at alpha. It in fact is the moment of this term, which is uh, negative one raised to summation i xi. So this is like the sum of uh, all xi, which is in fact the length of alpha, right? Because the length of alpha is the number of one cycle plus the number of two cycles, uh, sorry, the number of rows of length one plus the number of rows of length two plus whatever. So uh, the total number of rows. Uh, QR and everything else, you just drop the z alpha and then the rest of the term is just in place of alpha you substitute x so qr alpha x x beta so we have this if you recall you're going to express it as some function that of beta 
into some constant that depends on beta. So this constant is in fact the moment of this uh, class function, right? So we are going to try to find what this moment is in the ensuing thing. Right, so uh, to compute the moment, first of all, let's go back, look at this. Alpha choose beta, there's a Q raised to R alpha, uh, no, Q R lambda evaluated at alpha, right? Uh, so Q R lambda, we can use again, uh, Garcia's recursive formula, right? So we can again substitute in place of this, just uh, the expression that we had, right? Look at the last line of this expression. And then uh, look at what I'm substituting here. It is the same thing, except instead of beta, now we have multiple beta values because we have first the beta one that this uh, big Q term gets passed as an argument here, this beta. And then we have a new, some other beta two, right? So there's multiple, whatever, alpha beta is going around. So that's kind of confusing. Uh, so we substitute this Q, uh, we substitute into Q R lambda, it's uh, value from Garcia's from Garcia's formula. And we again obtain this moment part. So like I look at this moment, it's again uh, of the same form that we obtained above, right? It's, it's kind of like this, except it's for R square lambda. So it's in fact the moment of Q with the parameters R lambda instead of lambda and beta two instead of beta one. And it's evaluated at R lambda instead of at lambda, right? What I'm trying to say is that this this is the recursive part of the formula. This is the part because the Q uh, at lambda and beta one depends on its moment evaluated on a smaller partition and on some other beta two, right? So you basically we're going to use recursion to come up with the formula. Before we just jump into it, let's look at an example. Uh, what this example is going to try to prove is that uh, for a single row partition the moment evaluated at lambda is equal to the sum over T11. Now, if uh, you probably don't uh, remember, but T11 is just one minus V1, right? And uh, it's just this expression evaluated over lambda and one minus V1, right? So let's start with this recursive formula for the capital Q. Q, uh, which is this, and then note that Q of the empty set is one because uh, it's giving you the character of the family where uh, you have a long first row and then whatever is above the first row. Whatever is above the first row is nothing. So it's only a single row partition, which is the trivial representation. So its character is always one, right? So uh, we just have to evaluate this moment of AI choose AI one, A one I choose B one I. But we've looked at a similar calculation before where we had some fixed uh, thing in the uh, denominator of the uh, alpha choose beta expression. And how we dealt with it there was by differentiating B1i times and uh, um, dividing by B1i factorial. Right? Uh, it's the same thing here except because of the sign negative 1 raised to A1i, you will have exponent of negative t raised to i by i instead of just exponent of t raised to i by i. And the rest of it is going to proceed uh, the same way, except the exponent of sum of t raised to i by i is one over one minus t. So negative of that is uh, one over one minus t raised to minus one, which is one minus t, right? So that's why I have one minus t here, right? Uh, yeah, so if you notice what this is saying is, we are looking for the uh, coefficient of t raised to size of lambda minus size of uh, beta one. And there are only two values of t here, there's t raised to zero and there's t raised to one. So what this is actually saying is that beta one is either the size of lambda or is one less the size of lambda. And if it is the size of lambda, then the moment is uh, this expression, negative one raised to the length of lambda, uh, negative one raised to the length of beta one upon z raised to beta one. And if it is one less than the size of lambda, then it is uh, minus times that expression. So basically it is a sum over uh, this T11, uh, which is one minus uh, T, right? So that is for uh, when lambda is of one, when lambda is a single row, this is how we obtain it. So obviously uh, probably more 
difficult to do it in general. So we will just skip to this the general guess, this proposition. So what it is saying is that uh, if you have just a partition with L part and then you evaluate it at uh, its moment at uh, mod of lambda, then it's this expression of the right. Uh, the example that we just dealt with is the basic case for the induction argument that we are going to present, right? Because we dealt with when lambda has a single row and it obviously worked here because it was just uh, T11 because L was one. And uh, so I should probably explain this uh, delta term, this delta of beta one tilde beta one, just ensures that this capital Q gets past an argument beta one, right? We don't know what the argument is, but what this delta term is saying is that if beta one is outside the range specified by this polynomial T one L, then the whole expression is zero. So beta one has to correspond to some partition that's in this range specified by T one L. Right? That's why I use a different variable beta one tilde beta one, because when I open it over the sum of all beta, it should only give me the betas for which this expression is non-zero. Right? That's all it is. Uh, so we just verified above that it works for uh, T equals one, L equals one, sorry. Uh, let's now say that it works for all uh, partitions with less than or equal to L parts. So we have by uh, the original expression that we can expand this capital Q, should come with better name, uh, capital Q, we can expand it in terms of, uh, I mean, some recursive thing. So like basically this moment on the right occurs on a, a partition, which is necessarily of length less than L. So the induction, by our induction hypothesis, this can be re-expressed as a, a term that looks like that. So, which is what we're going to do, right? We're going to, right, we're going to do this. Uh, so, yeah, we're going to substitute into this. this. So this is actually, I, I kind of uh, combined two steps. What they should be is X, this should be X choose beta two, into the sum, into this sum here, right, of this whole product. And then, because it's beta two, uh, there'll be a beta two tilde and beta two, and then the beta two will only vary over this range. So I've kind of combined those two expressions. Like when you have, one second. So when you have some expression of this kind where it's uh, you have outside a sum of beta two, and then inside you have this delta beta two, uh, sorry, delta beta two tilde beta two expression, it simplifies to just a sum over, uh, like beta two and beta tilde have to match. So we just uh, change all the beta two tilde to beta two, and then we sum over this r lambda t two l. Okay, so uh, we obtain this expression basically, uh, and we want to find the moment of this at some lambda. So this is uh, the moment of this at lambda is the coefficient in this expression. So x choose beta one, beta two choose beta three, etc. That comes from this part because this whole thing will be raised to uh, ai, and it'll be ai. What is the coefficient of uh, v two raised to i? It'll be a i choose b two i, and then the coefficient of v three raised to i will be beta two i choose b two uh, i choose b three i b three i. This expression comes from this part. Uh, hope that's clear why. Uh, and then this expression comes from this part, right? Because it's just differentiating uh, differentiating several times this variable because it's a fixed beta one. So, uh, is that clear? Kinda, yeah. yeah. 
so basically the we want here uh, like alpha choose beta 2 beta 2 choose beta 3 so for the highest part it will be ai choose b2i b2i choose b3i so here if this whole thing is raised to ai then the coefficient of v2 will be uh, ai choose uh, b2i into v2i raised to bi and then this whole thing also will be multiplied by b2i so the coefficient of v3 will be b2i choose b3i and so on up to vli that's that's very clever actually yeah so that's uh, that's why this expression reduces to this. Uh, so we just evaluate this uh, differentiation. When you differentiate all of the things and multiply the v1i term come outside. So you get uh, this whole expression raised to v1i times, of course, this uh, i and this negative one sign also must come out uh, v1i times. So you get this expression into uh, d1l. Now, if you remember what d1l is, it was just 1 minus v1, 1 minus v1, v2, 1 minus v1, v2, v3, etc. Which is just uh, what you get when you evaluate the exponent. So you get in this exponent, you get uh, negative of v1 raised to i by i summation, negative of v1, v2 raised to i by i summation, negative of v1, v2, v3, i by i summation. And all of those terms will come out as 1 minus uh, whatever thing was raised to i. So it'll be 1 minus v1, 1 minus v1, v2, 1 minus v1, v2, v3. So that that is just d1l. So that's where the d1l. Is. So you get uh, this expression. Now uh, we're looking for some coefficient in uh, here, right? So let's expand this out. So if you expand this out again, you have the coefficient of d2. Uh, you want it to be uh, like say the coefficient of d2 is, um, is the cardinality of this partition b2. On the ith level, it will be b1i. B2 I. And then this whole thing will be raised to B2i. So it will be B2i raised to B3i, B3i raised to B4i, etc. And then the exponent on B2 will be I raised to B2i. The exponent on B3 will be I raised to B3i. Then when you multiply it out, you get the coefficient, I mean, sorry, the exponent of B2 is the size of beta 2. And its coefficient is just beta 1 choose beta 2, which is B1i choose B2i from each of the i parts, the product of them. Right? So you get this expression. Right? And now you want to look for uh, a particular, you want to look for the sum of these coefficients. Uh, recall that like we had this proposition that said that like, if you have a generating function mm -hmm. and you want to sum it over some polynomial and some, and the same as multiplying it by that. Right? So you want to get the sum of these coefficients. In this expression, which yeah. Yeah. yeah, carry on. Okay. So, uh, <coughs> Yeah, so what I'm doing is just multiplying throughout the polynomial that we were initially summing over. So if you recall, we were initially summing over this polynomial. And so what we are saying is we want uh, several coefficients over this polynomial. So it's the same as multiplying the generating function by the polynomial itself. So that is what I'm doing here. And then uh, this is the expression that we want basically. And you can see why this is equal to this. So we are look, we are looking for these kinds of uh, generating functions over ranges where beta one uh, tilde up to beta l tilde is in this range t one l over lambda. The t one l comes from multiplying d one l by t two l because t one l is exactly d one l into d t two l. Yeah. So you're multiplying some generating function by a uh, polynomial is the same as uh, summing over several coefficients in uh, the generating function. Okay, okay, okay. So now that we have this expression for the, the Q, the capital Q, uh, lambda and beta one, we just substitute it back over here. And then we get this expression where this sum is over. Uh, yeah, so this is what I was talking about earlier. So here we have a sum outside over beta one, 
and then something that depends on beta one. And inside we have a sum which uh, is a param which gets past this parameter beta one, but which like is actually over beta one tilde. So what this is saying is if beta one corresponds to some beta one tilde that is in the range specified by this polynomial, then this entire expression is non-zero. I mean, it can still be zero, but if it is outside this, is definitely zero, right? Because this term fails. So this beta one outside is not in fact unrestricted. It's restricted to be in the range that T one L specifies. That's what adding the delta. That's what I'm doing by adding delta. Right? That's what I'm trying to denote by this delta thing. So we can replace this sum over arbitrary beta one by this sum over this polynomial and uh, this partition, right? This is just shorthand notation. So uh, if this delta is one, then the negative one gets cut and the Z beta also term gets cut. So you get X choose beta one. And then from here you get beta one tilde, which is equal to beta one, beta one choose beta two blah, blah, up to beta L minus one choose beta. So which is what we set out to prove in the beginning. We set out to prove that this is like a simplified expression for the character polynomial. Once you obtain a simple, uh, simpler, uh, expression, it's easier to calculate moments with it. Uh, this is what we're going to do. It's just uh, basically the proof is just going to be that uh, this term is the uh, you need to substitute a term like this into the exponent to get a term like this. I mean, to get the uh, what do you call it? moment of a term like this, you need to substitute this uh, kind of nested sum of v1 to vn. So let's do an example. Uh, so we want to find uh, the coefficient of Q raised to lambda HK. Earlier we found the uh, moment of just HK, which would have been Q trivial, right? It would have been the multiplicity of the trivial representation. But now we're doing it for arbitrary representation. So uh, the HK term contributes this to the moment, which is in the same color. It's uh, alpha multi-choice uh, new, overall partition new of K. And then the Q lambda term has said, contributes this because of because that's what it is so it contributes this term and uh, yeah so this is the coefficient in this expression right the t1l is because it's the sum of several coefficients as i said before it's the sum over this so it's just multiplying the generating function by the polynomial uh, so if you simplify this exponent you get this so this is the generating function for the evaluation of this moment at n. Uh, from here, if you want to get, uh, so this is already just pretty not, it's not a good expression. So uh, one further simplification is we do this, we substitute in place of vj, uh, we substitute vj upon vj minus one, right? So what will happen to the denominator? We have terms like Vm up through V1. So Vm will now be Vm upon Vm minus one, Vm minus one will be Vm minus one upon Vm minus two. So on, it'll just keep getting cut. So you'll just have some term Vm here instead of V1 to Vm. Uh, I'm just using the same variables because it's too many variable sets. What I mean is you substitute. So this, instead of the V1 to Vm, these will just be replaced by Vm. Here also, they just be replaced by Vm. And uh, what happens to the T1L is interesting because the T1L will then be, uh, so let me just, So the T1L will look like this. It will be this term. So I made this substitution. It will just be product over uh, this uh, first term, product over I, 1 minus VI, will give you uh, the E term. So the E term is just uh, 1 minus E1 plus E2, where e, E1, E2, etc. elementary symmetric function. That is coming from this product 1 minus VI. And uh, this delta is the term that I've written down here. So that's what T1 L B. Right. So knowing this, we can uh, recast the above formula. 
which is here as this formula we have changed the t1l to this this part t1l this thing and then the rest of this h of t1 minus mu uh, this thing just comes from uh, i mean this is just this expression here so what this is saying is h of uh, h of the variables that h with square brackets represents some plethysm or oh yeah yeah so the h with the thanks the h with the square brackets is the plethysm is the plethysm of this uh, i don't know if it's a symmetric function is this function the plethysm of this function into the terms of the variable h where h is just 1 plus h1 plus h2 etc okay. so uh, so if we take lambda to be the empty partition then uh, what happens on the right hand side we should recover that old thing right so yeah, get uh, there'll be no uh, just there'll be no v's we are not interested in the v's yeah so you'll just get the h t 1 minus u part Uh, shouldn't we get h of uh, capital h plethys uh... no this is for k so you'll get uh, 1 over 1 minus u 1 over 1 minus u square 1 over 1 minus uh, each of them will come as a t so so it'll be t into only one, one variable the capital h will be in only one variable right so it'll be uh, t plus t u plus t u square plus t u cube those will be the things substituted into h So it will be one over one minus t, one minus t u, one my uh, sorry, uh, one over one minus t, one over one minus t u, one over one minus t u square, etc. Which was what we originally had. Right. So and then you can replace h k by s lambda finally. Uh... Yeah, so I uh, I get to that. I mean I won't prove it, but I'll give you that. So yeah, so the. This H is just uh, recasting the denominator into something, so it just uh, kind of follows on the definition of how plethysm works. So uh, you can do the same kind of operation for H mu, and like H mu is just the product over different uh, H mu i's. So you get this expression. Uh, this is the same thing, uh, and the stable range is this. Uh, size of mu plus the size of lambda this is kind of intuitively uh, i mean it's it's kind of intuitively easy to see this because like if you have n is greater than size of mu if you have n equal the size of mu plus the size of lambda then you can have partitions where each term that contributes to the mu is in a different thing so like you have uh, like all of the uh, terms have only a single entry like mu i u i or vi right for some i or for some bit so that is a you can't have any more partition than that that's the most uh, spread out a partition of a multi set can be is if each container only contains a single element and you can't have it any more spread. so that's the stable value uh to get from once you have h mu uh s mu because of the jacobi trudy determinant s mu is coming different values of h mu with sign Where is that Jacobi Trudy determinant? So it's just uh, summing over different values of h mu with appropriate sign, and uh, we have seen that if you want to sum over different values uh, with appropriate sign in a generating function, then it's the same as uh, looking at a constant term in a generating function multiplied by the polynomial that gives the kind of deficit value, right? So that polynomial is in fact the same. Uh, it's one over one minus u j by u i. Right, so it's the same expression, but you just have to multiply one minus u j by u i, and then look for the coefficient of uh, u raised to mu. Okay, so uh, okay. So so can you like um, somehow relate this to Littlewood's plethysmic formula? Uh, Littlewood plethysmic formulas. Uh, So they say that uh, the coefficient of uh, q lambda in H mu is s lambda. Right. Uh, the same. So here, not that one. The next one is the computing the same thing as little wood. Yeah. Uh, right. So it would appear that uh, if you look for the coefficient of u raised to mu in uh, this term, this one minus u j u i. The product over all i is less than j. Looking for the u raised to mu term in that is the same as looking for the uh, 
uh, sure function corresponding to mu in uh, the remainder of the this thing. So you're saying it's clear to you that this is uh, the same as looking at the plethysm of uh, sure function with capital H and then multiplying it by that kind of random on thing and looking for some coefficient, right? Yeah, if, if you actually, if you evaluate, if you simplify this further, what you get for the second expression is uh, h of h of h of h of is uh, s, s of lambda. Hmm. Yeah, so you get this expression if you simplify this further. So you have h of h of u into 1 plus v. Uh, h of a plus h of b equals h of a times h of b. So, h of, so you can split this up. So you have h of h of u, which is the first term that I'm written here. And then you have h of u into v. Right? So h of u into v, you can split it out as uh, sum over v raised to lambda into h lambda of uh, h of u. Okay. Uh, as one less h. So anyway, you, you can split it up as uh, x raised to lambda times uh, x raised to lambda of into h of lambda plethysm h of u. And if you multiply an expression of that kind by this 1 over 1 minus vjvi, you in place of uh, in place of the summation h lambda x raised to lambda, you get summation s lambda x raised to lambda. Because this uh, thing is basically it forces it to do a Jacobi Trudy thing when you're looking for a particular group. So you get this s lambda of h of h of u. So uh, looking, yeah, so this is a stable form because I'm missing the first row. Uh, looking for uh, the coefficient of Mu is the same as looking at the coefficient of s mu in this entire expression without the triangle u part. So, uh, so uh, you can also do the same thing for uh, uh, like reduce canonical coefficients or uh, stable values for those and then you get uh, these three things this part is cut off so i'm just going to read out uh, this says h plethysm uv plus vw plus uw plus uvw uh, what that means is uh, u is uh, u1 plus u2 plus u3 etc v is v1 plus v2 plus v3 etc and w is w1 plus w2 plus w3 so it's like uh, one variable from the u side, one variable from the v side, and then this part is one variable from the v side, one from the w side. The unseen parts are one from the u and one from the w, and one from u v w each. So h of uh, all elements that look like uh, and the stable range. Uh, yeah. So here, uh, if if you just do the same kind of thing that I was saying that uh, like vector partitions stable range should come over work out with this. But in literature, I've seen that the stable range, well, I thought it worked out with this, but uh, I mean, I see this somewhere that it worked out with this, but then later on, I saw somewhere that uh, it worked out to the sum of two partitions plus the first row of the third partition. So that bounce still holds. But uh, I mean, this shouldn't be the slide, basically. I've just uh, saw that after I wrote this. So that, that bounce still holds. Uh, and I had a counter example for this bomb, so, so that's why I put it in the slide. But turns out that's probably not the bomb. Anyway, uh, so the, uh, so uh, Sridhar, why, uh, why did you say these are the Kronecker coefficients? Uh, it's like, like threefold tensor product, huh? Right. So the, this would these are the uh, they call reduced Kronecker coefficients. These are stable values of uh, 
the first partition is uh, mu with uh, a long first row the second partition is mu with the long second row and the third partition is lambda with a long uh, sorry mu with a long first row mu also with a long first row and lambda with a long first row so uh, this is the when you tensor those partitions together the coefficient of the trivial representation which is equal to the kronecker product of the three ah uh, i see okay fine thanks uh, right so uh, now we looked at the generating function the issues with them are first of all they're difficult to express uh, just it's very difficult there a lot of variables you know it's very difficult to spot if there are any errors uh, so it's difficult to tell somebody else about the proof difficult to also verify the proof yourself uh, so overall it's not very satisfying they're also difficult to verify and uh, most importantly it's difficult to get any new information out of them uh, so far it got like very limited information uh, this is, uh, so what i would like is if somebody has seen this like what would help is somebody has seen generating functions as similar and uh, so we can then look up those generating functions see what they count and then uh, you know proceed that way try to build uh, some type of objects so that way or in some uh, you know sub cases at least uh one last thing i want to say about this the difficult to verify part is uh, it is still in general difficult to verify but i was able to write uh i was able to simplify the expression for uh, this this chronicler thing this i was able to simplify this expression uh enough so that i could write code to predict these reduced chronicler uh, coefficients so this i mean kind of cheats because it says the reduced chronicler uh, coefficient is some actual chronicler coefficient of some smaller uh, partition times some things that uh, is basically some repeated uh, little wood richardson coefficient right so it says it's some some but basically it was able to uh, apply this generating function to get an expression for this evaluation and then code that expression and then test it and then it seems to work So uh, this code just uh, tells you when the values are equal. So the residue is over the range uh, three to four. The range three to four is because uh, I mentioned I had some counter example for the bound thing. So that was between range three and four. So I was testing that. But uh, this works even in general. I mean, even from one to four. I only tested it till about six. But uh, So yeah, so if you take three coefficients, it seems that the expression you obtain through these uh, generating functions it matches with like the actual reduced Kronecker coefficient. So to that extent, it had, it had better, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I I don't know. This all like uh, I I feel this is some some more sort of sophisticated umbrella calculus here. What you're doing. uh it, it could be i have actually like had a corresponded to the symmetric function is it possible that in general not even on the just at the character polynomials level itself because after all you know garcia and gupil are doing it at the character polynomials level not at the symmetric function like right, because it changes a power to uh, yeah yeah exactly so it changes a power to some uh, binomial kind of thing that way mm. so maybe you know the if you just write it in um uh, I, i don't know much umbral calculus i don't know who is the person who uh, knows umbral calculus uh, garcia yeah but how do we catch garcia yeah oh uh we you know might know something about umbral calculus yeah yeah But like I don't know what a specific question to ask is. Exactly. Yeah, that's the problem. So yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay, that that's good. Uh, any other questions? Uh, what are those Q analogs in Garcia and Gopal's cycle? Oh, uh, 
Oh, I don't know the reference to the end of the paper. I need to print it. The other thing you could try to look for is like growth, growth, as you said, you know, generating functions help understand growth. Oh, this also actually is one minor thing which uh, if uh, you take the uh, like reduced chronicle coefficients for lambda mu nu and if uh, the size of mu equals the size of nu, no, the size of mu plus the size of nu equals the size of lambda, then you recover the littlewood richardson coefficient. So that uh, if you do by the code I was just showing you, if you just like, uh, it's just, uh, it, it just follows. It's like kind of follows easily that that is the case. Uh, Sorry, can you say that again? What did you just say? If you uh, evaluate the reduced uh, Kronecker product for lambda mu and nu, and the size of mu plus the size of nu equals the size of lambda, then these coefficients are, uh, they work out to be Littlewood Richardson for lambda mu and nu. Um, um, and what were you saying after that? And so I was saying like the, the, kind of the expression that I used to write the code based on that expression, uh, like that observation follows. It's, it's easy to see. Oh, okay. Maybe you should write that up. A bit, yeah, so that's that's encouraging, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not a major uh, result or anything, but it's just a, a, an observation. Like, I was just looking for proof that these are correct, so you know, evidence that these are correct. So, this, um, hmm. so this fact may have something to do with the uh, uh, block uh, identities appearing on the restriction coefficient matrix, right. Uh, uh, you have a nice conceptual proof of this uh, that uh, Kronecker becomes little stable. Uh, yeah, becomes I can stable. explain it like basically. Uh, yeah, but, so, you know, like this, uh, the, the, the coefficient, the, like the expression involves multiplying some Kronecker, uh, some Kronecker product or some three partition times uh, some other thing, which is like the little word Richardson part. So it's this Kronecker part times the Littlewood Richardson part, and the size of the things in the Kronecker depend on some uh, j, right? Some integer j which has some range. So if uh, so, this is how the x ranges are calculated, right? So lambda plus mu minus nu. So suppose uh, I'm I'm finding it a bit hard to follow. Maybe we'll discuss it uh, at more greater leisure. I mean. Yeah, I mean, I, the, the kind of footnote is that uh, if la the size of lambda equals the sum of the other two, then uh, j, j is constrained to be zero. So this Kronecker part doesn't occur. So uh, it's just the Littlewood Richardson part. And if you just work out what the partitions corresponding to that is, it will just be the Littlewood Richardson. Can you share your slides or maybe or, yeah, yeah. by email or, yeah, if you have it on your website? Uh, yeah. These are on Dropbox. Okay, I'll get them there. Uh, but yeah. Okay, that's uh, so. Any more questions? Okay, I guess, uh, yeah, if. That's it. Then uh, we'll uh, end this now. But uh, fr Friday there'll be another such uh, meeting with Shraddha, and uh, I would like to have uh, more of these kind of meetings. Uh, they actually somewhat uh, helpful um, because uh, yeah, I mean, and we we will only restrict uh, them to whatever audience you feel comfortable with. Like you can choose whether you want it to be public or just a WhatsApp group or you know, the mailing list or whatever. So, yeah. So I'm hoping to see some more um, suggestions for such talks. Okay. So um, thanks. That's, that's, we'll stop, end this here. Okay. Okay. Thank you.